Welcome to the I-5 Corridor. I'm Aiden Schneider. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host Tyson Alger. Tyson, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. I, I appreciate you letting me, me take a little bit of a break with these intros. That, that sounded yeah, really we, nice. Thanks. We like to share the load around here. Uh, anything you need, just let me know. I, I Well, I think this is episode 26 overall, and, and you know we haven't necessarily done them all together, but... Uh, you know, I feel I feel like we're getting the hang of this, uh, and I, I think a big part is being able to react to uh, just kind of the news the day presents you. And and boy, did Cyrus Abidilicio <laughs> give us a gift today, didn't he? He did. I uh, I've been a little torn. So uh, for for those who may not have seen the tweet, Cyrus said he was debating with a former teammate on if the 2019 Oregon football team or 2015 Oregon football team would win if they played. And at first, of course, my biased self, my initial reaction was, oh, definitely 2015. The offense was incredible. But as I've been thinking about it as the day's gone on, I'm not so sure. Now, now were, were, were you on that team? I sure was. Oh, okay, just, just, just making sure in case... Uh, yeah, people are curious about our biases. So, uh, <laughs> what what was your initial reaction like at first, and then when you thought about it? Uh, okay, so if if it's the hypothetical where everyone's healthy, my initial reaction was the 2015 team would house the 2019 team. Uh, the 2015 team is the one that we always say that if Vernon was healthy, that team was the one that maybe could have reached the playoffs for the second consecutive year. Uh, it was an offense that was as electric as it was the year before with Marcus Mariota at quarterback. Uh, the defense wasn't great, but it did have DeForest Buckner up the middle, who was had one of the most kind of dominant seasons that I've seen from an Oregon Duck on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and so, like, I was like, yeah, like, of course that team is going to blow out almost any other team in Oregon history. But I think it's an interesting matchup. And, like, I, I have my qualms, obviously, with the 2019 team's offense just because of the way that it was managed throughout that year. I mean, we are saying that they do have Justin Herbert, who uh, turns out is pretty good. Um, but the biggest strength of that team was that team's secondary. They, they led the Pac-12 in interceptions. And 2015, Vernon Adams, Darren Carrington, backyard football style of scramble it out, uh, go for the big play home run ball. That worked a lot, but if you're playing a secondary that was as good as that 2019 one, it you know could come back to bite them a little bit. And I apologize for my dog barking in the background. Yeah, I think that's a fair argument. Um, I just just looking back at that 2015 team, I I really truly do think that would have been a playoff team without the quarterback injury. Um, going back to the loss at Michigan State, that 31-28 loss. Uh, with Vernon playing with a broken finger. And even with him playing with a broken finger, right at the end of the game, it was probably two minutes left or less to play. Byron Marshall was wide open in the end zone after the corner fell down and, and Vernon overthrew him. So, And then Vernon missed, I believe, the Georgia State game and the Utah game and the Colorado game. Maybe even Washington State. I think he came back at Washington. Um, later in the conference schedule, but I just, the 62 to 20 loss to Utah at home, it looks bad, but a team without its quarterback losing momentum, uh, I just think you kind of got to throw that one out. And it, it's, it's, it's hard to, because in, in my head, I want to say that like, okay, that Vernon team wouldn't ever have a game like the Arizona state one from that, the 2019 team had where it was basically like, they had their chance to make the playoff and then they had a complete, just egg, like they laid an egg on the road. Um, but also then you can't say that he didn't have a perfect season either just because he didn't have that opportunity. Like we, we just don't know how that team would have been with Vernon over a complete whole, entire season stretch. We don't know if he would have had a bad game here or there, but um, man, like just fr from covering the, both of those entire seasons, there were times where I thought the 2015 team was as good as any team in the country. And I just don't think I ever felt that was 2019. And that's such like a BS sports writer -y way of like being like, oh, the feel of this team or the look. But that's that's just the way it felt to me. Yeah, but I, 
I think that's a, a valid take. And so the more I thought about it, when I started to think about the 2019 team, when you just take total talent into account, I think maybe it skews a little bit towards 2019 because of who they had on the roster. But I think the thing that limits them a little bit, honestly, is coaching. Because, especially on the offensive side of the ball, because it's easy to say, like, they had Herbert, they had all these names, and we know what Herbert's been able to do in the NFL. It's been unbelievable, but I think... Even people who thought he was going to be good didn't quite see that coming from his product in college. And, and I just think the, the openness and aggressiveness of the offense in 2015 would really play to their advantage. And when a good offense is playing a good defense, I think especially as we saw from some of the, the points they put up in 2015, a lot of the times the better offense wins. The, the one thing that like I haven't seen in any of these discussions really yet either is like, 2015 was essentially peak Royce Freeman. And I, I think that, you know, the the further we get away from Royce's career, I, I think maybe there were times during his career where it was like, oh, maybe Royce is as good as LaMichael was. I think now that maybe a little distance has came, people realize that LaMichael was, was probably more dynamic. But Royce was really freaking good. And, and that, was, that was the year where he was absolutely at his best. I mean, that was a dynamic Oregon running game. Like, that was... Uh, that was a really good football player right there. And, and that's somebody who's getting kind of glossed over just because we're talking about Darren Carrington and uh, Vernon Adams and, and kind of that connection. Yeah. There. And and one more thing about the 2019 team. I also think there is something to be said for the fact that we're talking about what ifs with Vernon Adams and the 2015 team. No, it, it was a really successful yeah. season. Uh, when you look at the Alamo Bowl, 300 plus yards of offense in the first half. That's potentially the most dominant offensive half by an Oregon football team ever. And and that's saying something given some of the teams we've had, but there's definitely something to be said for the 2019 team, although they didn't make the playoff getting the job done and finishing with the Rose bowl title. What, what was the difference between like Vernon in the locker room versus like Marcus? <laughs> Vernon's just a lot Kind of, I mean, Marcus was friendly too, but Vernon's just a lot more like outgoing and kind of playful and messing around. And Marcus was a really nice guy and, and definitely would, would spend time around everyone, but he was just a little more reserved and, and not quite as much joking around and poking fun and just having a good time. It, it would have been fun to watch like the, the cave on Thibodeau go up against, um, just kind of Vernon's scrambling ability, uh, just kind of like that speed there. I mean, like, it, Ver, I think people might like see some Vernon highlights and confuse him for like a running quarterback. Like, this wasn't a guy who was ever like compiling yards, but he he was running around a ton in the backfield, and and that would have been a, an awfully fun matchup to watch because I, I did me- mention the secondary, but Oregon's front seven from that 2019 team was awfully good too. Like a- Andy Avalos's defense that year was was a pretty complete package. Yeah. That, that would be a super fun matchup to see. Um, Vernon was, like you said before, just playing backyard football. Like, I, I swear, so many of the big plays that happened that year felt like it was completely outside of the structure of the offense. Like, the play breaks down, Vernon's running around, like, one, runs to one hash, runs to the other hash, and then, lo and behold, Darren Carrington's open 55 yards down the field. Um, and I think it was really great that, the coaching staff kind of gave him free reign to do that because they knew the talent and they knew what he had. And I think that I really do think that that would have ended up uh, carrying Oregon to a playoff spot. Had he not been hurt. I I love that combo because anybody who listens to this podcast or reads me probably knows that, you know, I'm probably not the brightest football mind out there in terms of, you know, just straight up understanding the X's and O's of the game. But Vernon and Carrington looked like to have just the most simplest, like, just go get open. I'll find you if it all breaks down, like, just go. And, like, talking to them, like, during that year about, like, how their scramble drills worked, like, they basically said that was essentially it. It was just play breaks down. I'm looking for Darren. Go get open. I'm going to chuck the ball. And it worked a a lot. Yeah, that's (laughs) something. So I, I wouldn't say I'm the brightest football mind either, but... 
one thing that I've always kind of been amazed by is just throughout my career, there's a decent amount of players who don't always know the playbook super well and are just freak athletes and get it done. And I think most people probably wouldn't know that. And I mean, I'd never notice unless I heard people talking about it, but it's uh, the athleticism really shines through. And I, apparently you don't have to study the playbook all that hard to be successful. Uh, one, one thing that I did see get brought up a lot about the 2019 team was like, okay, well, Jacob Breland would be healthy. And Oregon's offense was, uh, it did have a different dimension when, when Breland was healthy. He did, I believe it was about midway through the season, he got hurt against Stanford. Um, but something that gets forget about that 2015 team too is they had three really good tight ends on that team. It was like Evan Bayless, Johnny Munt, um, and Farrell Brown. Like all three of those guys have played in the NFL. Um, and I, they, the 2015 team's wide receivers were also kind of getting glossed over because of how good 19 secondary is. But Dwayne Stanford was a very competent Pac-12 receiver. Uh, Braylon Addison was fantastic before his like knee injury, and he's still a successful player in the CFL. Um, Charles Nelson can do a lot of different things. Um, I, I think it would be an interesting matchup. And, and I don't think... I do think the 2015 team would hypothetically win, but I don't think it would be a blowout per se because 2019 was a very well-built team in the trenches, and, and that's where you win a lot of football games. This is why they need to bring NCAA football back so we can we can sim this game a hundred times. Okay, so I want to get your thoughts on uh, the McCollum trade here in a second, uh, but first, oh boy, did you kick that football? Oh yeah, yeah, it was. Uh... It's, you, it's feeling you, good to, to get back out there, and I feel like I'm really extending the range again. Yeah, for, for people who uh, who missed it, you can check it out on the I-5 Corridor's Instagram page. Uh, Aiden posted a video uh, from working out last week at a Grant High School where he's just, like, casually dropping 60-yard bombs. Um, that one looked like it could have cleared for by another, like, 10, 15 yards or so. Uh, awfully straight, nice follow-through. We're, we're going places, man. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling I, it. I got my fingers crossed. That's the goal. Now, is that, is that like, a, you, you were telling me something about like the, like the ball felt good. Yeah, that's, uh, that's always been a big thing. Um, the, how broken in the ball is makes a, a huge difference on how it feels coming off your foot and, and how the ball flies. So I had a, a nice, pretty broken in NFL ball that I lost a couple weeks back, which was a real bummer. So I had to go buy some new ones and I'm working on breaking them in, but progress is slow. So, uh, I was able to, to borrow a broken in NFL ball and it's just, it's night and day. It felt amazing. So, so, so I imagine like you probably could have like, um, uh, understood the deflate gate scandal scandal. Oh. In, in terms of in terms of somebody no, like liking their balls a very specific oh, absolutely. way, absolutely, yeah, no question. Okay, um, CJ's gone. Th this is something that I think that we've all kind of expected for for quite some time. I mean, if you're a Blazers fan, it feels like it's been like five years of of will they, won't they with with, with the CJ tra trade rumors. Um, I wrote a little piece that went up yesterday. I haven't talked to you yet. Thoughts? Oh, I got. I got some mixed emotions about this one. I think ultimately it was the right move. Uh, maybe a little later than it should have been. But that being said, it's a bummer to see CJ go. He's he's such a great, well-spoken guy and, and representative of the city, and I doubt you could find anyone with a bad thing to say about him. So it's unfortunate to see him go. But I think if it's been it's been proven over the last nine years is it that dame and cj have played together that they're good they're good together they're a good combo but there's only so far they can go and it, it's time to move past that that being said i'm a little skeptical of the plan but i i do have some hope <laughs> It's always weird when a city loses like one of its stars, and obviously CJ is not like a Dame quite level of star, but he he's definitely he's an NBA All Star. He's a guy who is making a hundred million dollars or a hundred million dollar contract. Like he he's in that kind of top echelon of of 
just I know who that guy is. And, and Portland doesn't have a ton of those guys. We only have like one major professional sport in this city. No knock on MLS. We obviously like our, our timber coverage and, and like those games. But, I mean, the NBA is a different animal. And um, obviously Portland is, is coming to a point where there's going to be quite quite the change in the franchise identity moving forward. And, you know, you just kind of got to trust <laughs> Uh, tr- trust people in charge to uh, to shepherd that to a to a new place. Yeah, it's it's funny looking at the roster. Like in the the last game against the Magic, you look on the court and it's like within a few days, you're you're hardly recognizing who's playing anymore. There's so much turnover, and I think it's a ballsy move um, to make to make that big of a change to get rid of Covington, to get rid of Nance, to get rid of CJ. And I see where they're going with trying to open up cap space to lure a free agent this summer, but the skeptical Blazer fan in me wonders what's going to be different this time when we've tried to lure free agents here in the past and we really just haven't had much success at all. What are you doing for the Super Bowl? I think I'm going to watch at home. Who are you? Okay. Who are you? Who do you want to win and who do you think is going to win? I mean, I want Cincinnati to win. I think it's going to happen. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, the Rams are, like, such a good team. And, I mean, just, like, to get to the most simplistic part of Cincinnati has a terrible offensive line. And the Rams have Aaron Donald and Von Miller and a bunch of other just dudes. Uh, So I don't necessarily like that. But... Like Joe Burrow's just kind of got it, man. Like I, I don't know what it is. Like, like he seems like, like this seems like it would be like the first part in his story, uh, and it's like beating like the big bad, bad Rams. And like there's there's some other quarterback that he reminds me of a little bit who uh, was uh, kind of lanky, young faced, facing a big Rams team in his first Super Bowl. <laughs> I'm not going to say Tom Brady, but I'm going to say Tom Brady. Oh, you. Uh, You'll you'll have to you'll have to listen to this and uh, I, I had posted a podcast uh, earlier talking to Shane just about the Oregon men's basketball team and uh, I make like a small little case for LeBron coming to Portland in two years so you know just 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 no it's good it's good just just you know just just check it out let me know Not what you a think stretch, but uh, realistic when 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 this is the official podcast of the LeBron James Portland chapter, uh, you know, we've just been here from the start. <laughs> We're going to get a billboard. We're going to make it happen. Could you like even imagine, like, how do you think Portland would react to like having like a star that big? I don't even know. That would like, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to even think about because it feels so impossible, but that would mean, would you, is your in this take of yours? Is this LeBron coming to team up with Dame? So my my take was LeBron ha- LeBron has one year after this year left on his contract. Like last week, he kind of like let it let it fly publicly that he wants to end his career with the Lakers, but his priority is to also play with Bronny. And if that happens to not be in LA. If that happens to not be in LA, he is willing to go somewhere else. So to do this. you're saying we'll majorly reach for Bronny in the draft. Correct. Okay. Because, because I mean, like you don't trust the Blazers to draft well with these picks anyways. <laughs> so, so reach for Bronny with the draft. Dame and Dame and uh, LeBron are tight. Like you see it at the All Star game all the time. And uh, yeah, you know, I'm just just wa- just watering the seeds, man. That's all we're doing. I'm surprised you didn't throw your name in for interim GM. That's, that's not a bad plan. Oh. You know, things are going pretty well here at the corridor. Uh, I, I I just I don't need the extra stress. It would stress. take a lot for you to step away, but if they made you an offer, you couldn't refuse. Is Dame the biggest star this city's had? Like, sports-wise? Gotta be. Am, am I missing any? I mean, like, like, there's a street named after Clyde Drexler. Like, but I just, it, you know, and I'm, I'm obviously missing a large portion of this because I've only lived here for 10 years, but. I, th- I think he is. I think with the, the level he's played at for the length of time, I think that there have been other, you know, you got Bill Walton, 
in the 77 championship, but he moved on and, and played in Boston after. So, yeah, I think, I mean, I think the Blazers are the, the biggest game in town and Dame's being recognized as, if not already, will very soon be the greatest Blazer of all time. It's, uh, this is an opportunity for Oregon. Here, this might be a bit of a stretch, but like the Blazers have been like very consistently good for like the last decade. Like it, it's not often where like they just have a complete, like it's going to be garbage this year. Just trust us. Maybe wait, come back two seasons from now. Oregon, Oregon football, like they got a new coach. It's like this new program. It's this new brand. It's a lot of like, get to know us, get, like this, I I just really feel like that this state, when things are going well, you have two things that people really care about, and that's the Ducks and the Blazers. And if the Blazers are going to be bad for a couple of years, that's probably an opportunity for the Blaz or for the Ducks to like even further their footprint. Because I remember when I first moved here in 2012, that was coming off of a period where the Blazers had struggled, I think, for like two years. The Ducks were as good as they've been. And, like, that was, like, the period where, like, every single truck had, like, the O with, like, the feathers, like, around it, like, back plates. Like, it was, like, like the peak of, like, win the day, like, like that push of, like, like Oregon. And, like, I feel like that, like, that was the biggest, like, the, the Oregon brand has, has felt to me. And uh, if this landing team's pretty good, I, like... It, it, it could it could be get really big for them. I feel. Yeah, they they got a two year window to capitalize before LeBron shows up in Portland. So, got to take advantage. <laughs> oh, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine? Well, I, I feel like we got to get out of here before any other loony takes uh, pop up. Uh, any parting thoughts, Aiden? Twenty fifteen team wins. It's my it's my final. Decision. Oh yeah, it's. I mean. Like we were trying to be PC about it, we, but 2015 wins. The we all, side. We anyways, all that's the I five corridor podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, if it comes down to kicks, like who do you want? You want this guy? I'm I'm, ta- I'm taking myself every it. time. Yeah, yeah. Let's just let him. If they let him kick from like anything further than like 35 out, Aiden Schneider is <laughs> money. All right, we'll talk to you all next week.